Uh, next, I want to welcome Mark Farmer to the stage. Mark is CEO and founding director of CAST. He has over 30 years experience in construction and real estate and is a recognized international commentator on a variety of industry and policy related issues. Mark authored the Farmer Review, an influential 2016 independent government review of the UK's construction labor model entitled, entitled Modernize or Die. From 2019 until 2023, he was appointed as the government's champion for modern methods of construction and house building. Mark served on the Construction Leadership Seniors Advisors Group from 2020 to 2023 and was an advisory board member of the Construction Scotland Innovation Centre from 2018 to 2023. Mark is a national co-chair of Constructing Excellence and from 2020 until 2024, served as the chair of the West Midlands Combined Authority Future Homes Task Force. Mark is an honorary professor at the University of Salford's School of Built Environment and holds honorary doctorates from the University College of Estate Management and the University of Wolverhampton in the UK. He is a trustee of the Moby Educational Charity and was recipient of the CIOB President's Award in 2021 in recognition of his work driving long-term change into the, con into the construction industry. With that, I want to welcome Mark. Thank you, Brandon, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's great to be back in Canada. The last time I was here was in Montreal in February 2020. It was literally two or three weeks before global lockdown, and it probably is symbolic in terms of the amount of change that we've seen nationally and internationally, and particularly in construction since that point. So what I'm going to do over the next half hour or so is take you through some of the impacts of those changes and try and compare and contrast what's happened in the UK market, particularly when it comes to innovating construction and modernizing what we do, um, with the position here in Canada, as far as um, I've been able to research and just contextualize and, and make sure that there's some kind of read across to the issues that you're facing here. So I always start when it comes to modern methods of construction, which is the term that we use in the UK that is quite all-encompassing, it's quite global, it includes the likes of what you would call industrialised construction, digital technology, as Tom's has been talking about in terms of digital twins and data analytics, um, but mostly the concept of off-site manufacture, moving the process towards a quasi-industrialised approach in manufacturing rather than in-situ traditional construction. Um, and the context for why we're having this debate really stems from some of the issues the industry continues to grapple with. Um, and that ultimately comes down to waste. It comes down to the massive waste and inefficiency we have in our industry, and this is something common between UK and Canada and actually most developed economy construction markets in that we waste so much in different ways. So this study is a British study that shows you that for every, this is for a public works um, project um, paid for by the taxpayer, for every pound spent only 50 pence goes towards the actual finished in situ construction. The rest of it is stuff. It's either on costing, it's either risk transfer, um, it's transactional inefficiency because of the way in which we contract and we subcontract and we sub subcontract and the way that our industries have organized themselves around the need for flexibility inherently means we have this really, really inefficient um, delivery model. But added to that, we have a huge issue with actually getting what we do right. And we don't want to overgeneralize, but unfortunately on the bottom line, in terms of what we do as a sector, there is a lot of defects, there's a lot of rework, there's a lot of having to go back and start again. And that's a, it's not a blame game, it's just a reality of how our industry operates. We all know the issues we have in terms of the inability to drive continuous improvement. Every job we bespoke and we start again and we repeat the mistakes. And again, this is a British study which indicates that rough and tough, um, about 20% of everything we do is rework or defects. So we're having to, to actually spend 120% of effort to achieve 100% of an outcome. You combine those two things, you combine that transactional waste, you combine the physical waste, then we have a productivity issue. 
And that really goes to the heart of why we've had such a big debate in the UK, certainly around modern methods of construction, trying to address that productivity challenge. And it also um, manifests itself in relation to um, some of the more consumer-facing sectors that construction operates in, particularly house building. So I work mostly in the residential sector in the UK, and there's lots of studies, and this is one of them that indicates that some of the problems that we have with new build housing um, relate to those areas of construction that are the most labour intensive. So where we had those issues around productivity, where we had the need to flood the workplace with labour, where we start to get exposed to issues in terms of the competence and the quality of the workforce, then you have a recipe for potential problems. And all of these areas here, which is effectively um, a study of the UK home building market, single family homes uh, primarily, um, all of those areas, the ones that with the biggest hit rates in terms of defects relate to high labour intensity areas. And that, there's a, draw, a, a definite correlation with the risk for failure. So just um, picking up on the report that Brandon mentioned in the introduction there. So in 2016, I wrote a report for the UK government looking at the construction labour model, and that effectively became a bit of a review of construction per se. Uh, I made various recommendations, and I'm not going to go through all of them now, but if I was to give the progress against these recommendations a bit of a school report, exam card type status, this is what it would look like. It's a fairly mixed bag. And what it indicates is that the government in the UK, on the back of my report, reacted. It recognised the need for there to be a public role in trying to initiate change in a sector that inherently is private sector-led. Um, and it went about that, and I'll come back to that in a second. I also made some recommendations as to how the government should intervene, should influence, should mandate. Um, and the, the broader environment in which innovation would prevail. I'll probably um, lead you to the final note, which has got two uh, red crosses against it, as the one that I would flag up as being the most important and instructive. And again, I'll come on to the impacts of this in a second. That need to remove cyclicality in our market. So the problem with our with construction markets, and again, this is a common issue across most developed economies, is the fact that when we have economic fluctuations in the broader background economy, construction tends to be disproportionately impacted. So that boom-bust feeling of the industry that we work in, the fact that capex in construction is quite high, it's discretionary, that, that actually there's a role for government in trying to smooth those peaks and troughs and to act counter-cyclically. And you can see from the two Red Crosses that in the UK, it's far from clear that that's actually happened and that's had consequences which I'm going to talk to you about. So one of the things, going back to this point of me trying to contextualise the UK versus Canada, one of the things I just thought I'd look at is your labour market dynamic relevant uh, relative to the UK. So the top graph is, um, is the UK's total construction employment position going back to the early 1990s. You can see the... Um, the peak was actually um, just before the global financial crisis in 2007, 2008. Then we had a big, big slide back. Um, and then it picked up again to the point of COVID. And now we've been, we're falling backwards again. Whereas in Canada, interesting that your graph looks very different. So you had a peak again, to global financial crisis, but you kept on rising and you have continued to keep rising. So actually... The, the background dynamic in the UK is very much around labour scarcity. Our workforce is shrinking. We have a huge issue at the moment. Some of it self-inflicted through the likes of Brexit, where we've imposed labour mobility restrictions, particularly from the European market. Some of it's demographic. Some of it is societal in terms of kids not wanting to come into the industry as much as they did. All of that is a major pressing issue. Whereas here in Canada, you, it appears, from the statistics anyway, that that's not so much of an issue you have a rising workforce. So actually that sort of baseline position that we have around the immediacy of need to improve productivity to address labour market scarcity doesn't look as serious here in Canada as it does in the UK and certainly most other developed economies. I would say Canada and maybe Australia to an extent are the only two countries I know of in certainly in the G7, G15 nations that have managed to relatively successfully expand their construction labour markets over the last 20 to 30 years. 
whereas most other economies have got the same issue as the UK. We have a shrinking workforce. So that's an interesting start point for this wider debate about how important innovation is. What are your change drivers here in Canada? How, how, um, how much of a burning platform do you have in terms of needing to change your delivery model? But you also have quite an interesting combination of things going on from what I can make out as well. So you appear to have overcapacity. So going back to the fact that you have um, a growing workforce and you've managed to increase your um, labor force, particularly your trade labor, so your site-based labor force has not been as constricted as we've had in the UK, um, you do have poor productivity. You do have labor cost inflation, you have wage inflation. Um, but you also have, apparently, a difficulty in resourcing from, for key projects. So it all seems a bit contradictory in terms of the combination of various things going on that are influencing the change drivers in your market. So I put that out there. I, don't, I haven't got an answer to that. I don't know why. Maybe um, here in the room there's this is something that's discussed. But you seem to have quite a unique cocktail of labour market characteristics that seem quite different to the UK, but in some instances also the same, particularly the poor productivity issue. So sort of picking up on some of what Tom just spoke about around the role of um, infrastructure and public programs. One of the problems we've had in the UK um, is that the cost of infrastructure projects has been going up inexorably, not just in relation to inflation. So we've had hyperinflation linked to things like um, the Ukraine crisis that's disrupted global supply chains, and we've all, I think, globally suffered from material price inflation um, and volatility from that. But actually, just the cost of doing stuff has been going up. And what that's led to is that governments increasingly have, got, have found it quite difficult to justify value for money on major projects which the construction industry is engaged in. In the UK, public works accounts for about 30% of total construction output. 70% is private sector, but that 30% is really important. And it's really important in the context of what I said earlier about cyclicality, because the government can use public programs to offset any downturn in the private market. Whereas what we've got in the UK is actually, uh, we've had um, a private market downturn, which I'll come on to in, in, uh, shortly, but actually the government has stopped lots of public works programs as well. It's partly down to post-COVID austerity, but actually partly down to the fact that prioritizing spend on ind an industry that s appears to be actually um, wanting more for less, if you look at it in stark bottom line language, has become difficult. And it's politically really, really challenging to sign off major programs and major projects when actually we've got this um, reputation in the UK, but it's actually, it's a global reputation, I would suggest, for major projects going awry and having blowouts. And as I say, I think you have parallels here in Canada, which is why things like the digital twin program is so important. How can you get in front of that? How can you use technology to ensure that the public purse is protected? Because that's effectively what it is. You're talking about taxpayer pounds and dollars here. So this is all... all also in the context of the fact that doing construction is becoming more and more difficult. So irrespective of the labor market that we have and the differences between the UK and Canada, um, what is common and appears to be generically common across most international labor markets is that regulatory burdens are increasing. In the UK, for instance, we have a whole building safety regime that's been introduced on the back of the Grenfell fire in London a few years ago, which has made construction quite rightly much more difficult to do. But actually, after the event, it should have been in place before in, um, in most people's eyes. The role of competence has now come to the fore. The checks and balances around how we get permitting has now um, got more difficult. We also have the inexorable rise of decarbonisation as, as a mega trend that we're having to face into. And that's manifesting itself in relation to regulatory standards. Also, ESG-driven investment patterns we're seeing from the major funders of construction work. Um, that are prevailing and are actually driving higher and higher standards in terms of how we design, how we build, minimizing waste, the materials we use, et cetera, et cetera. So just to sort of bring this to um, a, a, a lessons learned phase, if you like, of this presentation, I thought I'd just share that journey since my report in 2016, some of the things that have been going on. So in, when my report landed, the government responded a few months later 
um, it actually initiated quite a lot of change in terms of a, a, um, a broader UK government support program, funded support program with taxpayer money for innovation in construction, covering digital, including the Centre for Digital Built Britain that was mentioned um, earlier, but also a program called Transforming Construction as a broader context for trying to drive off-site manufacturing, digital site technologies, the productivity challenge being at the heart of it and how we build smarter and more efficiently recognizing we have um, a resourcing issue um, and we've been on this big journey since then since 2018 through to where we are now um, and it's fair to say that there is one overarching theme that's come out of this is that we were making a hell of a lot of progress but we've been derailed and the headlines you see scattered around the outside of that slide there are all symptomatic of a derailment of positive momentum for change towards changing our industry, government supported from 2018 onwards, that actually has come undone. And there's three main reasons that I just want to share, and I think hopefully of some context for Canada in terms of um, what it means. Firstly, the one I've already referenced is the fact that we've had a, one of the, the cyclicality of the market has appeared in that intervening period. So we have had a big economic downturn in the UK and it's been um, made worse by political um, volatility. So we've had more prime ministers than I care to count in, in the last three or four years. That has all had economic impact, particularly the very short term prime ministership, um, um, ministership of Liz Truss in 2022, which led to a recession. So we had um, interest rate uh, rises. It crashed the housing market in the UK. The broader economy went into technical recession. The construction market was immediately hit by that. And for the reasons I've already stated, public infrastructure didn't pick up the slack. So the whole market slid, even social housing. Um, there was other issues around social housing in the UK, but every part of the UK construction market was hit in a downward trend, just at a time when we were trying to innovate, just at a time when private employers and private capital was making decisions around, shall we do things differently? Shall we just experiment with a better way of doing things because we know it's the right thing to do? And immediately, it came back to a position of how do we just survive? How do we get through doing business here and now and we'll worry about all that stuff downstream? And that has had major consequences in relation to the pace, the momentum, not necessarily the end trajectory because my view is that we're gonna get there anyway, but it's just gonna be more difficult and longer now. Um, but that importance of having an economic downturn without the ability to actually offset by using um, government um, spending programs, plus one other thing as well in our permitting and planning system, so giving planning permissions for buildings in the UK and major projects, has been completely dysfunctional. So you add those three things together, you pretty much bring an industry to a standstill. And we've seen some pretty scary contraction in the UK construction market over the last 18 months to two years, which has tested the resiliency of the industry working. And it's certainly challenged the whole idea of innovative construction and those businesses trying to do things differently, whether they're startups or whether they're actually mature businesses experimenting with doing things differently. The second reason for failure and derailment is I'm gonna be fairly clear and, and, and blunt about this and unvarnished. Some of those businesses that set themselves up as change agents, as innovators, particularly in the modular housing space. So we had quite a big push to move towards modular housing, volumetric, three-dimensional three volumetric um, modular housing, technically failed. Not financially, some of them financially failed as well, but they technically failed to deliver. The big promises around better quality, doing it in a factory, not doing it on site. We'll actually do it quicker, we do it better, we do it with more certainty, we do it with less carbon, all actually proven to be false. And some of these headlines you see here, however uncomfortable they might be for people reading them that may be associated with some of this stuff when I show this in England, that's the reality. And it's done massive damage to the confidence in the wider theme of MMC and modern methods, particularly modular construction. And I don't want to overly focus on modular because actually, it's only one part of innovative construction and it can be done very well and it, it is being done very well. But unfortunately, these headlines prevail. And in the market, I don't know what it's like here in Canada, but in the UK, the journalists who operate in our trade press and in the national media like failure.
because they get headlines, they get sensationalism, and it pushes our market back a hell of a long way. The third reason for failure, to be quite frank, and it's been massively frustrating for me as being someone who's been trying to advise government for the last seven or eight years, is actually just a lack of a government plan. So irrespective of the fact we've had a big economic downturn, the government could have done things to actually safeguard public money that was being invested in innovation and to try and pump prime and continue the pump priming of the market towards uh, innovative techniques. What's happened is there's been some misjudged investments in certain key businesses that actually weren't backed up ultimately by demand-led transformation. So there's no point putting money into a modular housing company, for instance, or a digital technology company, unless you're creating demand, a, st a stimulus for demand. And when the market slipped, actually, those, those companies effectively became zombie companies. So a lot of British taxpayer money has been wasted because the government didn't have a strategic plan, didn't have the long-term commitment to actually see something through. So when the ec economy slid, it dropped the idea of supporting innovation pretty quickly. In fairness, it had other competing issues, including COVID, so we can't forget that. But this is really important in terms of understanding that if you're going to change an industry and government's going to play a role, whether it's a national government or state or province government, you have to be in it for the long run. You can't pick it up and drop it. You have to actually stay the course. Saying all of that, and that's fairly depressing, I would say there's a real positive in terms of what's happening in the UK because what the industry's worked out and mostly because of that labour market graph I showed you earlier with the fact we have a declining labour force, is most of the larger companies, and all of these headlines relate to house builders in the UK, some of them some of the largest in, in the country, have all decided they've got to change the model anyway, irrespective of government intervention. They're just coming to that decision in their boardrooms around the longevity of their model, the resiliency of their business models, the fact that some of them have got shareholder returns to protect. They're all deciding they're going to have to reduce site labour intensity and they're going to have to embrace modern methods in some shape or form. And all of these headlines relate to moves that are being made and they all are in the last 18 month, two year period through which we've had this massive volatility that actually are suggesting that they're getting on with it anyway. And in some respects, I would analogize this change to what's happened in the automotive sector, where the move towards electric vehicles has been actually run through a filter of hybrid vehicles in the first instance. So we still have a bit of a mental block around going full electric vehicle um, conversion, mostly because of the infrastructure constraints and you know, range anxiety and all the things that no doubt you have here in Canada. So actually, hybrid vehicles are still the preferred um, mode of transition. And I, I just feel constructions in that space at the moment. So the big bang of volumetric modular construction, for instance, which we tried to get going in the UK, which could have actually provided massive additionality if we'd got it right and we had the economic circumstances, is now being toned down to a more progressive, incremental approach to changing the manufacturing techniques so they become part traditional, part manufactured. So the pre-manufactured component or value or percentage of a job is gradually going up, but it's not a huge swing of sending out 70, 80% of stuff to be done in the factory. It's more like 50%. And that's manifesting itself in a few ways. So in the single family housing market, most of the large UK house builders are panelizing. So because they're actually having to react to some of those regulatory burdens, and particularly around um, operational efficiency and carbon, um, op the op um, operational energy efficiency rather, um, they're panelizing the fabric. They're actually moving from open panel timber to closed panel timber. They're looking at adding insulation, first fix M&E. Uh, ultimately, they want to put the external cladding on as well. We have a fixation with brickwork in the UK and the planning sensitivity of aesthetics is really important. So, you know, the utopian position is how do you simulate brickwork, handset brickwork laid by a bricklayer in big panels? So it looks the same, has the same robustness, um, and that's still slightly unsolved but when that happens that could be transformational and also they're looking at the internal fit out because there's no point putting the fabric up and actually leaving all the bathrooms and kitchens to site intense labor again and be subject to all those defects that we looked at earlier and there's a story that's happened recently in the uk that's quite instructive so persimmon second biggest house builder in the whole country uh, announced an investment into a modular house builder called top hat um, this would have been about 18 months ago two years ago. Everyone thought that means persimmon are going, we're going to move into volumetric modular housing. In reality, that was not the plan. 
And in reality, it's top hat have got financial difficulties, as most of the modular companies have had. What Persimmon were looking at was actually a product that top hat owned a patent on, which is a panelized brickwork simulated aesthetics it's system, um, which you see in the bottom right there. Persimmon had their own timber framing business. They wanted to put two together and to drive that more hybrid vehicle and anal analogous uh, transformation that I spoke about. In the, the general contracting market, in, this, in the more complex apartment building, condominium space, we're seeing tier one contractors make the same decisions. They're actively looking to reduce the site labor intensity by precasting frames, by unitizing and precasting facades, by using bathroom pods, utility covered pods, m and &E that's prefabricated, plant rooms, risers, runouts, you name it. There's isolated parts of the construction journey that are now being done in a factory, but they're being brought to site and being encompassed in what are otherwise traditionally built jobs. This trend, particularly in residential, has really started to take root over the last 18 months or so, particularly in some of the complex jobs in London, where labour is short and actually the ability to deliver the, num the peak labour histograms that some of the contractors need on these jobs is nigh on impossible. So it's forcing the market towards a position that the government was trying to actually uh, um, pump prime, but actually the market's going there anyway. And we've looked abroad in some of those instances to see where the innovation um, can be not just repeated and start again, you actually pick up good ideas. So this is a system from Australia, um, Hickory, some of you might have heard of it, um, from, um, based in Melbourne. Uh, Mace, who are quite a large UK contractor, have licensed this concept, which is a precast concrete um, framing system with a unitized facade clipped on, com combined with use of bathroom pods and utility cupboards. It is inc it's reduced their site labor intensity by half. Quite simplistic, it's not volumetric modular, but it's, it's a high pre-manufactured content. The other thing that's really important here as a lesson learned is that this whole approach to off-site manufacturing and digital does not happen in an analog environment. You have to embrace digital in some shape or form to get the true business efficiencies of moving to a manufacturing process. What you see on the right is actually the Top Hat factory in Derby in, in central England. It's a site labor intensive um, process. This happens to be in a factory. You've got workmen crawling all over each other. You've got bits of scaffold and, and staging, etc. Um, that, you know, they would say that that's a digital process and there is a digital design. There's a, there's a, a Revit model, there's a CAD CAM interface into the CNC machines in the factory, but actually the rest of it's manual. And it ended up being, has been a constraint in terms of the throughput, the tack time on the factory line, etc. So you have to get the processes right. And when you get the processes right, you can digitalize them. And there's very few examples at the moment. The one on the left is probably one of the few. It's a, a timber framing business called Stuart Milne. Um, that's now, it's now actually called Donaldson's. It's been acquired where it's a fully robotic line. 10 million pounds spent on one line in a factory um, in, um, in Oxfordshire. Um, but it's taken a long time to get to that. They've had to actually have a manual version of that that they've refined and refined and then they've put robots into it. But it takes a lot of time and effort to get there. And despite what I've said about the failures, particularly in the volumetric modular market, when it's done right and it's done well, it can be world leading. So in this photograph, two of the three tallest volumetric modular buildings in the world sit there in the middle. One's 40 odd stories, the other's nearly 50 stories. They're both in South London, both built by the same company, you British company, but there's only one business in the UK that can do this. You don't change an entire industry with one business. And this is the problem around scaling up and driving industry-wide change. You can't, cannot lead it to individual innovators and pioneers. We need broader impact, which is why the government has a role. So I'll, I'll, I'll close this by maybe just starting to think about what's Canada's opportunity here. So there's definitely a big piece here around using decarbonisation and government agenda for decarbonisation and private investor agenda for decarbonisation uh, as a driver for change. So using policy, using mandates, using building regulations and permits to actually change the way that we build, both in terms of operational energy efficiency and the thermal efficiency and air tightness of buildings, but also embodied carbon. So what's really interesting in Canada here, I see that you're starting to think about embodied carbon, you're starting to think about measurement of that, how it could be used in public buildings and public works. And that's a lot better than we're doing in the UK. 
So we've had a big debate in the UK, and again, politics gets involved here, where we've oscillated from being, right, we're going to have to go to 2050 net zero carbon. Then the previous government got cold feet and said, we'll, we'll come off that a bit, and we'll just slow things down. The future home standard that you see in the bottom left there is our approach to how we decarbonize energy efficiency in new home building. It was greeted with a fair amount of contempt from most people in the industry who, who want to actually decarbonize. It's not very ambitious. And it doesn't talk at all about embodied carbon. It's purely an operational energy measure. So there is a thing here about the political commitment to set out a direction of travel and a pace that industry can get behind. And hopefully Canada can do that a bit better than what we've done in the UK. And also to build on that, the mandating of different methods of construction into public programs. So I, I see here from a national and from a province based perspective that you're getting active in this space, that there's various initiatives being launched in relation to modular homes and use of digital technology and MMC, that's good. But just taking the lesson of what's happened in the UK, it can't just be sporadic programs that are interspersed into the market and left. You have to have a long-term change strategy so anything here, whether it's province-led or national, you have to have a coordinated effort across a, a number of fronts. One of those fronts is legislation around quality and assurance. Because some of those problems I shared with you about the UK experience of poor quality modular home building was mostly down to the fact that the whole regime around how we sign off on those buildings wasn't in place. There was confusion. Our building regulations don't really factor site-based building inspectors going into factories. They, they're just not set up for it. And actually, government just relied on some private certification companies just to you know, hopefully things will work out and you'll model through. The reality is it didn't happen. So actually, one of my big takeaways from all of that is that you've got to get on the front foot around regulating for innovative construction where you have different construction details, different robust details, different materials, you need to embed the lessons, the, sorry, the rules for how you use all of that into your building control legislation. Not just guidance, it has to be legislated, it has to be technical documents that back into your building permitting system. And I would refer you to New South Wales in Australia as being somewhere where that's happening. So the guy you see there, David Chandler, who's the outgoing building commissioner in New South Wales, quite a controversial guy, but he set in train an entire reform process that includes reforming their building regulations for innovative construction. So actually what's done in the factory is not treated as a product, it's treated as building work. So the inspectors who are responsible for signing off on non-standard construction techniques have to go into those factories and inspect what's going on there as well which is the only way to address it until you get to a point where you're absolutely fully automated on assurance and quality, then you can treat them as products. The other thing Australia is doing in New South Wales is it's taking a whole system-wide approach to innovation. It's um, using digital, so some parallels to what Tom's shown you from Infrastructure Ontario. Um, it's using digital um, inventory, some of the geospatial uh, commission techniques for things like land assets and utility assets, all being digitally mapped. Um, it's now looking at planning reforms that use pattern books. As soon as you do that, you start to bring into a, a rules-based planning world the options of how you link that to manufactured products, manufactured solutions. And you start to join the dots around land planning construction in a digital and a manufactured innovative um, approach. And you need to think about your workforce. So even though you don't have the problems that we have in the UK, you do need to ensure that you, are, you have a competent workforce able to do the work that you're putting in front of it with new techniques. So in the UK, we've had a big shot. We are having a big shot because we don't have a fully competent workforce and we're only finding that out now. So even though you don't have the downward pressure on labour supply that we have in the UK, you need to ensure the Canadian workforce is competent across the board. Professional, technical, trade, that needs to be ensured through the qualifications that, that are being achieved, but also ongoing upskilling and reskilling of the workforce. You also want to measure change. So when we talk about MMC in the UK, we actually have defined it. We've categorised it. We have seven categories, so we know what we're talking about. And we also can measure it through pre-manufactured value, the percentage of a job that is manufactured. So just talking about change, you have to be able to measure it. Otherwise, you can't improve it. And finally, to wrap up, you know, everything I've taken you on there in the last half hour or so has been a fairly um, roller coaster journey of 
positivity, being let down, actually renew positivity. It's a real roller coaster. And I've given it to you in a fairly unvarnished fashion so you can learn from it, hopefully. There'll be some people that will come and say, yeah, follow the UK. It's the greatest thing since sliced bread. No. We have been on a real journey that everyone needs to learn from. And wherever I go in the world, I try and share the reality of that journey. But in all of this, we shouldn't lose sight of why we're talking about innovative construction, which is we do need to change. Some of the things I set out around the beginning of this presentation around context are not going to go away. So whatever happens, we shouldn't lose heart. We should continue to drive to want to be better. And there's ultimately going to be business drivers for doing that, as well as the role that government does or doesn't play. But for me, it's a truism that we're going to change just how quickly we can get there. So thank you for listening. I'm um, happy. Got some, I think we've got some time for questions. So very happy to take questions. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Um, I've been in the industry for over 20 years now, and I, I really resonated with your uh, comment on the cyclic, cyclicity, or however you say that word, uh, of the industry. Um, I've seen it happen here. I think our federal and provincial agencies are very good, as you've shown in your graph, at filling in the gaps when the industry d does dip. Uh, 2008, we saw it with the extension of our, our young subway to the north. There's a bundle of P3 hospitals that came out. Um, and those, uh, those benefited greatly. I think our problem is when it comes to the municipal agencies. Um, there's a lot of innovation that comes from the federal provincial governments. We're seeing British standards coming in, all these technologies being asked for on um, RFPs. But then when it comes to actually operating these things at a municipal level, those agencies I think have too much power and they're in direct conflict. Um, so we're seeing like I think we're going to talk about it later, but permitting in this city is a disaster. Um, there's the operations of these transit things that are in conflict. Like it's, I think that's the issue. And, and I'm not sure why they have so much power when the money is actually coming mostly from federal and provincial means. So I think that's maybe something that's a little different here. Maybe you didn't really touch on that in the UK, but... Uh, do you see something like that as well in the UK or <clears throat> municipal level? Uh, yes, it's a really good point, actually, which I didn't pick up on. And, um, you know, so we've had a, move, a, a push in the last four or five years towards devolution. We're actually more the power to make decisions, particularly around spending money, actually devolved to places and regions. So, and that has manifested itself in a series of what we call combined authorities, where parts of um, the country effectively have their own elected mayor and they have their own budgets set for housing, um, elements of um, infrastructure, elements of education, um, but they obviously operate within a broader national context. And that has caused issues, particularly when there's political differences between the national government and a um, regional government. So in London, uh, we have the Greater London Authority, GLA, which until we had a change of the national government a few weeks ago, um, was a Labour London um, mayoralty with a Conservative government, and they didn't agree on anything. That actually got in the way of uh, decision-making. It meant that the, the money being, uh, being spent was being spent in a way that wasn't aligned to national priorities, and there was political point scoring going on. Um, they also have the autonomy to set their own building um, standards within reason. Uh, there's some particularly um, um, technical issues around what's called, known as the London Plan, which means that the standards in London are different to the rest of the country, which then creates confusion. It creates cost issues and viability issues in an area where, for instance, housing is, is massively needed, but it's too expensive. Um, so there's absolutely a problem there, in structurally in terms of how government operates, but also the, how politics overlays on that and aligning things for what should be for the national good. I don't know what the answer is, to be honest. I think it's one of those things. I think at the moment it's going to be interesting to see how the UK moves forward. Now we have a Labour national government, the West Midlands around Birmingham, the Greater Manchester, Liverpool, London um, and the North East are all now Labour mayors. So they're politically all aligned. They should all be wanting the same thing. If there's a national policy, it should be immediately played out, both in terms of how the money's spent, but also some better alignment around standards, technical standards as, as well. Um, 
And we also had, you know, quangos. So we have agencies that actually are responsible for various things that there's a big debate as to whether they're doing that efficiently. So we have Homes England, which is a, a, a they don't build homes, but they dispose of the money. And there was a big debate as to how effective some of these transactional bodies are, public bodies are in doing that, that job. Thanks, Mark. Uh, I'll just mention it for the recording, but Brandon Searle with the UNB Offsite Construction Research Center. Um, you know, we've talked a few times and we could probably talk for hours and I won't bore the crew. So I have two questions. Um, one is early in your presentation, you talked about the issues that they're seeing in, in homes um, that are related to labor. And so in Canada, you know, there's, uh, we have less skilled in general labor coming into the workforce and there's been a lot of emphasis on, on attracting people to the colleges, to the trade schools. Um, I come from a family, I'm an, I'm an engineer, so they usually make fun of me around the dinner table because they're all trades and, and blue collar. Um, and so th I often hear from family members, you know, it's great that there's, they're trying to push people through, but the quality, they're trying to push them through too quick and quality is going down and then you're seeing what's happening there um, in, in the UK and, and in Canada as well. So what is, uh, what are they doing either, you know, in the early education system to, to kind of train people? Is there anything changing that you've seen uh, to increase the quantity without, you know, lowering the quality of, of the trades coming into the workforce? Yeah, so it's a, it's a really interesting point. So I've just, um, in the last six months, I've concluded a review of um, what's known as the Industry Training Board, which is a statutory body in the UK. It's quite a unique thing. So we have a construction industry tra training board that takes a levy from all construction employers, and that levy is centrally collected and then used to fund training, uh, particularly vocational and technical training, apprenticeships, stuff like that. In um, conducting that review, I did quite a lot of research around the numbers in terms of who's coming into the industry, what are the pathways that they're coming into the industry through. And actually, it was it was a little bit of an expose on, there's a bit of a myth, actually. And I did say, and I reinforced the myth by saying there's not enough young kids who want to come into construction. The reality is that there's actually quite a few there's a lot more than actually end up coming into the industry that at 16 years old are close to the industry. They're either taking a post-16 course in the construction-related discipline, but somehow we're losing them. The pathway into the industry is still very difficult, and I think that's inherently down to the fact that kids are obviously quite... They're, they're making decisions around career path. Um, they're quite... Um, nebulous in terms of you know well, what do I want to do and when do I want to make a, a decision it could mean that they do a construction 16 year old construction course but end up not coming into the industry a lot more of it is the fact they can't get work which is bizarre based mm -hmm. on what I've um, shown you and that's because the propensity to hire particularly employed people rather than self-employed people 40-50% of our entire construction workforce in the UK is self-employed that's a really important point here mm -hmm. um, is quite low so the number of apprenticeships that start in, in the UK um, is declining. It's going backwards. Um, it, it's only partly down to the number of people that are interested in coming into construction. It's partly down to the fact we don't have the pathways. The m way in which we train kids, I think, needs to be reformed. We need to have much more flexible, modular pathways rather than being quite rigid and siloed. So if someone, at the moment, you have to decide if you want to be a bricklayer or a carpenter, or a plumber or an electrician at day one, and then you, you follow that path. I think we need more generalistic grounding before you decide what you want to specialise in. I think you need more multi-skilled um, approaches as well that give people flexibility. You want the pathways to take them to site management to be much better defined. At the moment, the, the institutional network or the, the framework for technical education in construction in the UK, I don't think is fit for purpose. Mm -hmm. It needs a lot of reform. And as I say, only part of it is down to the numbers of kids coming in. But if we um, address some of those issues, we'd have more people coming in, we'd have more absorption, and we'd have better alignment of skills to what the needs are of the industry. Yeah, thank you. Um, and the next question is uh, related to the Top Hat. So um, Top Hat I visited in, in Derby in November last year. Uh, I was really impressed. Um, 
obviously it's a lot of labor in there, not a lot of automation, but um, you know, it was a pr impressive facility and, and a lot of overhead, uh, as you know, and the quality of materials is quite high. Um, at the time they were talking about building their new factory, which was gonna be the size of 11, what we call soccer fields, you would call football. Um, and, and I understand that's not moving forward now, but um, when we work with companies over here uh, in the modular offsite construction, industrialized construction space, a lot of them are family owned businesses around for years and risk averse and hesitant to, to automate. And as a, re like they try to minimize their overhead as much as possible. So how, or what are you seeing in the UK for those companies that have been around and are hesitant to, to automate or, or invest in the automation? And what role is the government playing there in helping companies do that? So I think the whole turmoil we've seen in the, in the modular housing space that I've outlined in the presentation has really put the brakes on the expansion of that sector and it's affected Top Hat. There's no two ways about it. That, that second facility you refer to has currently been stopped. Um, but actually in the last week or two in, back in London, a winding up petition has been served on Top Hat. Uh, they've actually survived that as of the last 24 hours, I believe that they've paid the bills that they need to pay whoever it, the the um the creditor was that, that was going after them but they want it's a it's a knife edge position it's quite precarious the idea of smaller sme modular um house builders and actually just modular providers whether it's in the uh, education health defense space is quite an interesting one because we do have a healthy segment of that kind of market in the uk market um businesses that have been operating for 30, 40, 50 years that have survived all of that stuff that I've spoken about, which has tended to be the larger startups with big, shiny factories, lots of CapEx investment, that then, as soon as the first recession hit, couldn't, didn't have the resiliency in their business model. What those family-run businesses have tended to do is they, they resisted or they, they've just been unable to invest heavily in technology. So they tend to be the more manually um, uh, labor intensive approaches, but they just refined the model that works. They've got their commercials right, they've got lower overheads. They actually, some of them in the UK also have a revenue model, not just a CapEx selling model. So they hire their units, particularly in the school building program. There, there'll be modular classrooms that they get a rental for that gives them liquidity. It gives them the ability to prop up their balance sheet. Whereas the ones that have failed are high levels of CapEx intensity, um, they um, basically are, are, are heavily aligned to particularly the housing market. And when that housing market goes and you, or you have very low levels of investment into schools and health, which we've seen in the UK at the moment, you've got no resiliency. And it's the ones that have spent the most that are the ones that are first to go. So I just think there is a real lesson here about maybe being smaller less sexy in the world of what politicians like to have photo opportunities in big new factories. I just think you're going to see a much more dispersed, distributed manufacturing model in the world ahead. Thank you. Um, Helen Goodland. I'm a principal at SIAS. We're a research and consulting firm specializing in construction, and we're based in Vancouver, so probably as far away from here as, <laughs> as England is. Um, so we were recently hired by um, a consortium led by the North of Tyne Combined Authority in the UK to do a sort of a, a review of their construction innovation scene there. And what was interesting about that was that they were doing that primarily to not just motivate their domestic uh, companies, the uh, local authorities and things, to be more innovative by just really understanding what they had. But they were also interested in looking at um, export potential and positioning the sort of the region around um, being able to sort of punch above its weight, I guess. Um, and what they were leveraging really was the digital construction capabilities. We found that there was a number of companies there that were doing amazing things and also tying into their local uh, research, academia and things. And I think the UK, from what we could see, is doing a much better job of integrating their innovation development processes with um, you know, everything from education, training, research and government. And although I understand where you're coming from, that it's, it's still a work in progress, I feel like Canada hasn't quite got that sorted out yet. And I wondered whether that's something that you saw as an advantage, whether there's some things that you see that UK is doing well 
because I know that there was a lot that you said that they could work on, but I do feel like there's a lot that you're doing well that we can certainly benefit from hearing more about, and that integration was certainly something we saw. Yeah, so, so the one bit that I believe UK is world leading at when it comes to innovation is our um, is more related to the professional services sector. Yeah. So the world of design and consultancy, um, we are world renowned and have been for a long time, particularly in design. So we worked, uh, British consultants work on jobs all over the world and you know we're proud to do so. Um, and, and the government recognizes that. So when it comes to export potential, most politicians equate export potential in construction as being design consultancy, project management consultancy, maybe to an extent construction management. They don't equate it to selling manufactured construction products. So that's where this dichotomy is between the off-site manufacturing sector, which at one point in 2018, absolutely the regional authorities um, were all thinking about not only can we build factories to employ local workers, we can build local homes, we can then export them. We can export them to other parts of the country in the UK and then we can export them abroad. And that just never came to pass. The volumes weren't there. The the um, the economic volatility has, has kiboshed that. But when it comes to the world of um, consultancy, the interface of digital and technology, the support that things like the Centre for Digital Built Britain, CDBB, have, have given, um, and the fact that I think technology and digital in political speak is seen as something a lot more investable by governments, regional and national government, I think you're in a different, completely different zone. I think the problem that I refer to, and I've been quite explicit on, is actually the world of the physical process of building, the manufacturing, the, the moving things from a site into a, a factory, everything that goes on behind it around the digital enablement, the embracing of artificial intelligence, ge um, uh, generative design is another thing that is coming pretty quickly, automated costing. I'm a QS by background, so my practice, we spend a lot of time cost planning, even now manually. That's gonna flip very quickly now with uh, AI-based cost planning techniques. All of that, you know, I think we've got some pretty good systems and structures and institutions in the UK. So I think it's a, it's a good call out just to balance the, the debate as to what's working and what's not. So you know, I've just you know, reinforced the fact that my, my, most of what I spoke about was about the physical manifestation of the, manu the, the uh, MMC. Thank you. Good morning, bonjour. My name is Ari Andrat, Professor of Engineering, University of Toronto. Um, actually, before asking my question, I wanna ask a question from audience. Do we, ha do we have any colleagues from construction from Switzerland or Germany or Austria? Yeah, there is one, okay. Uh, so, uh, if I wanna order a material to do my research, for example, uh, I'm working in mass timber, digital fabrication, advanced manufacturing, and, um, and um, stuff like that. If I wanna order a material, that would be cheaper if I order from Switzerland or Austria or Germany, for example, cross-laminated timber CLT product, and if they ship it from, from Europe, all the way through Atlantic to Halifax and all transported to U of T. So regardless of the efforts that we do to reduce uh, complexities in terms of construction, labor shortage, and expertise, so on and so forth, material is an issue, right? Uh, what are your thoughts on that and your experience in the UK? Thank you. Yep, so it's a very good point. I think, you know, the, the reality is construction materials historically have always been linked to indigenous capacity to either grow, in case of timber, or to manufacture. So as soon as you're in the world of global supply chains, then the ability to optimize your material cost is at the whim of all sorts of things, including global conflict, a la Ukraine, energy pricing, um, uh, uh, the um, exchange rates between currencies, all things that are actually quite nefarious and very difficult to control. I think that's the reality of the world we're in. You know, certainly in the UK, we import more materials than we uh, export. Um, so we are very exposed to that kind of things. And all of the hyperinflation we saw in materials in 21, sorry, in 22, 23, on the back of the Ukraine conflict, uh, actually um, pay testament to that. So I just think, it's one of those things that we have to recognize 
I don't think there's an answer to it. And, you know, we work in a global economy where you have to understand that there's dependencies there. Certainly, you know, from a national strategy around construction, if there's an indigenous ability to use materials, then government should be really wise to that. And I just think here in Canada, obviously, there you know, there's uh, a big tum uh, timber, lumber uh, um, market, um, which I'm not sure what proportion of your market is using that, particularly in commercial grade construction, mass engineered timber. Uh, there's obviously a whole sensitivity about fire, combustibility. And in the UK, you know, unfortunately, it's that whole thing's gone away because of Grenfell. But I know here in North America, in Europe, there's much more affinity towards using indigenous materials that have got local supply chain connections that reduce that volatility. And I just think we have to work harder from a efficiency, a whole, whole life carbon perspective to try and make those models work. So we're not shipping stuff around the world and at the behest of you know, the global volatility that we see. Thank you.